We are in Romans chapter 2. Going to be talking about the whole chapter, but we're not going to read the whole chapter, just the last two verses, if you'll read along with me. 28 and 29. A man is not a Jew if he is one outwardly, outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Join me in prayer. Dear precious Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for your song, Lord. Thank you for those with the ability to put word to song, to melody. We ask that you would uh, just uh, join with us now and let us understand your word that we may grow deeper in our walk with you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Those, that statement by Paul is really pretty earth-shaking in regards to him. I mean, he was a Jew among Jews, the highest trained, came from the right family, the right tribe. And circumcision certainly was a part of that Jewish rite of faith that each one was supposed to do when they were eight days old. So it was a big change for him to say that circumcision of the body is not what's important, but circumcision of the heart, that God comes in and cuts away that part of us, that sin nature that refuses God, that goes its own way. So that was a major, major accomplishment in Paul's life, a major change that he, he really did repent from one way and turn and go to the other. Last week we looked at, last two weeks, we've looked at chapter one of Romans. And chapter one was focused speaking to the Gentiles the non-Jewish people. Chapter 2 here largely is turning the attention to the Jews, speaking to them, because he's talking about the law and he's talking about their attitude. But even though it's to the Jews, we know that it's for us as well because of that scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, that says all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So every bit of this word, even if it was originally written to, a, to the Jewish people, is something we need to consider. Even though, like in the minor prophets we're reading, some of that prophecy went to the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom or some different peoples, we need to study it for the principles that are contained wherein because God has said all Scripture is good and God breathed. So we want to look at it today and see what he's talking about. The chapter begins with Paul talking about judging. And it's something we like to throw up in people's face. Don't judge me. Don't be judgmental. And that is a good thing to say he's aligning with Jesus on this teaching in Luke 6 37 through 42 Jesus said do not judge and you will not be judged do not condemn and you will not be condemned forgive and you will be forgiven give and it will be given to you a good measure pressed down shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them the parable, Can the blind lead the blind? Will they both not fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. Paul is talking about in, in the person of judgment, the Jews 
had a very judgmental against the non-Jewish people. They were chosen by God. They were chosen to be his people. God did bless them. He did call them to be the ones to tell the world about God. So they did have that very special start. But it kind of went to their heads and they started thinking of themselves as more special, more loved than the other people in the world. And that certainly isn't the case. God loves all the people. And he wanted the message of his love, whether Old Testament style or New Testament style, to go to each and every person. But the Jewish people had, as a whole now, we're, we can't be absolute about every single individual, but as a whole, <coughs> they took the attitude that the non-Gentiles were not worth God's love, were not worth talking to. And we even saw that in the uh, message we had some time back about the Good Samaritan, where they wouldn't even help a non-Jewish person because they might become unclean, because they might have some difficulty. So they had developed this attitude, but yet they were being judgmental about what the people were, and they were actually saying, okay, if you want to come to know God, then you need to do the things we Jews have done. One of those was circumcision, and that's why Paul brings it out at the end of the chapter. So even though Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law and to usher in the, the state of grace, the Jews were still saying, okay, that's fine, accept Jesus Christ, but you need to follow all the rules of the law. And that wasn't the case. They were oppressive. Uh, the, the, the direction they had taken the law was oppressive to keep people in their place, to make them feel worthless, to condemn them, to say they were worthless, rather than taking the principles of the law that God was trying to speak. We always need to look at and understand the principles of what God is saying. The key words Jesus speaks here that tell us the deep meaning of his discourse are when he says, do not be condemned. That's about the worst. That's, that's about the end of it. That is saying, worthy of death. You do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. And Jesus keeps turning around. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give to others, and then you will be given. And so it is very apparent here the weight that Jesus is putting on this teaching. We are not condemned the other as unworthy of God's love and salvation. But it's easy for us to think that. They're not worth saving. God wouldn't want them in his heaven but God loves everybody and God can change every heart. This is the twofold nature of the action of judging that sometimes we fail to recognize. We, rec we are to recognize wrong. We are to be discerning that there is wrong being done, but we are seek to seek to correct the wrong and seek to lead the person who is doing wrong to full fellowship with God. But our typical action is to reject the person and say they are not worth redeeming. This is the judging is what Jesus and Paul are addressing. And both Jesus and Paul are really direct and harsh in their portrayal of the one who judges wrongly. Jesus called the person a hypocrite. And Paul wrote that such a person who's doing these things is storing up wrath for themselves for the day of God's wrath against sin when it is revealed. And so it is a very serious uh, act to commit of having the wrong kind of judgmental attitude towards people, of deeming them worthless. Again, it is not the same as recognizing when a wrong is done and seeking to help that person come to know the wrong and come to know Christ who can change their heart. Too often, we try to be the Holy Spirit. We try to tell people, we try to, and we do act like that they need to change who and what they're doing, who they are and what they're doing before they can come to church. 
but we need to bring them to Jesus Christ, let him change the heart, and then let him change that person to what he wants them to be. It is not our job to say they're wrong on this part, this part, this part, and need to change. It is our job to show them the love of Jesus Christ and then encourage them, teach them, and help them come along to where they hear Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ tells them what he would have them to change and when. And so that is a difference we need to know. Jesus says, they're a hypocrite if you do these things. Paul says you're saving up wrath for that day when God's going to come that we talked about last week in our sermon. Is that demonstrating love? Is that what we think love is? To to call somebody names like a hypocrite? Or to tell them you just wait till God comes and He's going to straighten you out? Yes, it is because they were doing that out of love. They, Jesus and Paul in this respect, knew that these people needed their lives changed, needed to convert from their sin nature, needed to accept Jesus Christ. And so as it were, even though those words are harsh, it helps grab that attention to save them from going over the cliff. We can we can see somebody heading for a cliff and if we have our attitude towards, well, they're just being stupid. They're just doing something stupid and let them go. We're not showing love towards that person. But even though they may be being stupid, even though they may be being wrong, disobeying the law, we need to stop and try to keep them from doing that deadly action of driving off a cliff that's going to kill them. We know We should know, we should believe, I hope you believe, that life without Christ means an eternity spent separated from God in hell. That's That's what Jesus said. That's what the Bible teaches. You can disagree with it, you can argue against it, but you're arguing against Jesus Christ himself because that is what he preached. And so it is love to try to prevent that person from experiencing that eternity even though they may not like what you say, even though they may end up not liking you, but you're trying to, in love and encouragement, encourage them to the right lifestyle, you are expressing love towards them. So that's the part about judging that Paul opens with. But he goes on in this chapter and addresses a bigger issue. Judging others is just one example of a bigger error. Paul is teaching that we must maintain integrity in our faith. You see, in that passage, he says, you who do this, you who teach this, are you doing the same thing? You teach them not to steal, but are you stealing? You teach them not to whatever it is, are you continuing? And he knew they were. One, because we're all human, because we all slip, because we all fall, because we all have to rely on, on the grace of God each and every day for our thoughts, actions, behavior, say what we say, what we do. And so Paul is addressing this issue with them that they were being high and mighty, thinking they were capable to teach other people Jewish law in their case, but they were not guilty of keeping all the law. If they were keeping all the law, then they would be perfectly righteous and they wouldn't need Christ. But that is why Christ came, of course, because no one person can keep all the tenets of the law. The law was designed to teach people of their need of God's salvation. And so he knew they were failing, but yet they were acting haughty and trying to teach the others how to be something they were not. And so he was cautioning them to take care of themselves before trying to teach. And that's what Jesus is saying. Take the speck, the plank out of your own eye. Deal with your issues. Then you can see to help other people with their issues. So again, Paul is expanding on what Jesus is teaching. A definition of integrity is the state of being whole 
and undivided. And to use a concept I coined last week's sermon, it's wrong for us to have a hybrid faith. And we understand hybrid more and more these days. A hybrid faith is a faith that embraces two foci. One is faith in ourselves. That's where we start. Because of our sin nature, as a child, as a young adult, as an adult, we seek to satisfy ourselves. We seek to please ourselves. We tend to trust our judgment, our actions, what we think is right to do. And then somehow the Word of God comes to us and we start realizing that we need Jesus Christ's salvation that He purchased on the cross. We need Him in our life and we embrace that. And so then our life becomes a battle of faith is as to which one is predominant. Are we still favoring our sin nature, our, our personal desires, what we want, or are we yielding ourselves more and more completely to God? That's the journey of life, learning to set ourselves aside, to set our wants and wishes aside for what God wants in us, what God wants us to do, and to lead more and more in His direction. Again, the Scripture talks about that, that a fountain, a spring, cannot bring forth fresh water and salt. You just wouldn't see it. And we need to know that we can't please God by being both in the world and our following ourselves, and then trying, when it's convenient to us, when it suits our needs, to follow the ways of God. That's what religion is. Religion is following a set of rules largely that we define, whereas Christianity, that relationship with God is following Him and that personal relationship with Him, and He speaks to us, telling us what we should do. This is what He desires, that ultimate faith in God and God alone. We're studying the Minor Prophets on Wednesday nights, and we're seeing how the people kept turning away from God, turning away from God. And God is patient and loving, and He sends people to them to say, change, change, change. And they might for a little while, but then they revert back. One of my favorite movies, just like millions of others, and it may be like one of yours, is A Few Good Men. I could watch that movie over and over again. And I have watched it a few times. It stars Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson, you know the others. Several times in the movie they talk about, because it's based on Marines, and they'll talk about the code they live by, that they have a code of honor, and they have other codes. And Jack Nicholson is being pushed on the platform, and Tom Cruise is trying to get him to say that he told him to do a code red, part of the, the internal not the written, not the formal, not the allowed code of uh, disciplining a fellow soldier, but one that was understood and practiced sometimes. He was trying to get him to admit, and Jack Nicholson goes into a long speech about how you may be dressed in your uh, pearly whites up in Washington, and criticizing me that's got to stand on the wall and protect you, but we follow a code, and that code is, and he goes into it, and Tom Hanks, uh, Tom Cruise just pushes him, did you order, and he finally blows up and says yes. We all follow a code in our life. We follow something. We may have multiple codes. There's a code for Sunday, how we act when we attend church, how we dress, how we do. There's another one uh, for work, Monday through Friday or whenever you work. We act a certain ways. Perhaps we uh, let things slip from our Sunday code and we engage in behavior with our fellow workers. There's another code when we're relaxing with our friends. So we have multiple codes. We tend to be able to compartmentalize things uh, according to the time we're in. Faith is a code. That's what it ultimately is. It's God's 
code. It's adhering to His Word. That faith is a code we Christians embrace. In our walk with God, the other subcodes we follow regarding family, work, recreation, should become subject to the code of faith in God. It doesn't mean some of those values within our code are wrong. They just need to not be in contention with what God is saying. If they keep us from doing, from not doing what God would have us to do, then they become wrong. Then they hinder God. Then they get in the way. And so we need to make sure that our other codes, our subcodes, if you will, adhere to God's code. And sometimes what God calls us to do calls us to different actions that do challenge us, that do cause us to change what we're doing, to cause us to question some of our ways. As we gain insight through studying God's Word and listening to God, however that may take form, we submit and surrender our code to His code. Our code should be and is to be that faith in God. Here's the kicker. We all have people we engage with who have rejected faith in God. Some just outright deny Him. They call us foolish. They mock us. Some may tolerate us, but they think we're a little addle-brained for being in church on Sunday morning when we could be sleeping or at the lake. Or they think we're uh, being a little overly uh, constrained because we may choose not to drink or not to do some other behavior that they think is all right. So they disagree with our code of faith. But they expect us to live according to what we say we believe. Non-Christians, in many ways, are more judgmental, if you want to use that word, more expectant that we do what we say we believe in. If we say we believe in the God, then they expect us to do what that God says. They may disagree. They may think it's all malarkey. But yet, we've said we, we follow this tenet, this code, this faith. And so they expect us to do that. And they're critical when we step out of that. They, and sometimes, sometimes, to our shame, they know the scriptures better than we do. They can quote scriptures at us a lot of times they're mistaken and they've misinterpreted and that's an opportunity for us to change. But the unbeliever has many problems with the teaching of our faith and they may voice that disagreement loudly, but to repeat myself, they expect to, to see us living what we profess. That's true without all through life. If you say, if you're, say you're, a, you're a fan of a certain football team, People may think you're crazy, they'll never make it to the Super Bowl or to the playoffs, but they expect you to be a loyal follower of that team. People expect each other to live according to the word they have said. If they perceive we don't do that, they perceive a double standard, and that tends to lead them to reject our faith. They see that we're not really real in, in our faith, that we're just professing something we don't believe in because we don't subscribe our life to that. If we don't live what we profess to believe then, we are, as Jesus said, hypocrites. Judging another for their failure doesn't erase my failure. In fact, when we do that, it compounds our failure. And so we need to be aware of that. Jesus encountered Saul later to become Paul, on the road to Damascus. He said to Saul, I am Jesus. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. One of the ways they used to drive the animals, to pull in the cart, pull in the plow, whatever, was they would have a long stick with a point on the end, a goad, and they would, they would uh, poke the animal in the hill or the backside to goad them into action. That's the pricks Paul is referring to. And there can be a lot of pricks in our lives, a lot of 
things goading us on that God uses. The very basic one is His Word that He's given over the course of thousands of years through many, many authors in order to teach us the right way to go. Jesus, when He left, He said, I'm going to go, but I'm sending you a comforter, the Holy Spirit, and He will guide you into all truth. That Holy Spirit goads us into action. It can be a friend that challenges us with something they've read in the Bible. It can be a leader in your church, Sunday school, pastor, deacon, anyone that God uses to, to utter His truth is God goading you, pricking your spirit, pricking your heart to follow Him more closely. And so Jesus encountered Paul. I think it was in Paul's life that God had been trying to get his attention. We see this throughout Scripture with many others. We see it with the tribe of Israel. God works over and over and over again to call people to a faithful life with him. And I really believe that he was calling Paul out of his uh, Jewish culture to follow him. But Paul kept entrenching, no, I've got to be firm to my faith. I've got to stick to what I believe. And then finally, God had to say, okay, and stopped him on the road to Damascus, blinded him for a while. He thought he could see, so God blinded him. And that got Paul to that point to where he heard God's voice. And he asked, who are you? And that's where Jesus replied, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. God wanted Paul that badly to be in his service. And Paul is a tremendous servant of God. It may be that the conflict and I, it caused Paul to increase God's efforts to live according to that code of God more closely. And so God took that direct intervening action. Sometimes we may say, I wish God would just speak to me directly. Or I wish God would let me know. And we need to be careful because he does sometimes, but God is a fearful God when he confronts us directly. We do better to develop a sensitivity to him. We do better to develop a wisdom in reading his word and studying what he has to say and applying it so that he doesn't have to pull out the big stick to goad us along. And so we are wise if we respond to him as he leads us, if we start listening to that still small voice. This past week, I was talking with another pastor and he told me a phrase I'd never heard before and I liked it because I like wordplay and it has that, it has a point to it, but it, has, it does use a wordplay. And I've heard others have heard it in a different vein, but what he told me is, a kicking mule doesn't pull. A mule's job is to pull the plow through the dirt or to pull the wagon of cargo. But if they kick against what the driver's goading them, they're not walking, they're not getting the job done. So a kicking mule doesn't pull. And that phrase is a good phrase for us. Which one are we? Are we kicking against the pricks that God is calling into our lives? Are we refusing His instruction, however that may come, in all the ways it may come? Or are we listening with sensitivity, surrendering to the Lord's urging to obey Him in whatever the task may be? Whether it's giving up some bad habit, whether it's talking to somebody about Jesus Christ, whether it's changing jobs, are we being sensitive to His goading in our life to obey Him, to follow Him? Are we surrendering to that task He's given us? Or are we stubbornly holding on to our own adjustments to that code, to our modifications of what the Scripture says? Whenever we say, well, that's not what God really means, we're changing His Word. We need to develop a deeper understanding. 
I've tried to always maintain the attitude that what I don't understand when I read God's Word, is it doesn't mean God's Word is conflicted. It means I'm ignorant, that I don't know Him. I don't know His Word well enough, and I need to study and listen all the more rather than change it to meet my concept of right and wrong or to change it to say I can do what I want to do as opposed to what God clearly says in His Word. And so Paul is talking to us through this chapter to maintain integrity in our faith. We say we believe in Jesus Christ, so we should do the things of Jesus Christ. That means when we fall, when we find out we have failed to follow God, we confess that to Him, we repent of it, and we ask Him to help us follow Him to do as He said. That's following the code. It doesn't mean we never fail, but it means when we do fail and we become aware of that, we yield it to God and get back on track with Him. That's what we're being called to today is to maintain integrity in our faith. And that integrity can lead others to understand they need to know the Christ we worship. But if they see shifting shadows, if they see us saying one thing and being in church on Sunday but doing another thing when we're out and about, it doesn't give them confidence in our faith. It makes them see God as we treat Him, that He is really a small God that we keep in our pocket and pull out when it's convenient. So is He God of all? Is He Lord of all or not? And I'll leave you with another phrase I've shared with you before. You believe in God, but do you believe God? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, oh, you are such a good, good Father. Lord, like a good Father, you discipline us. You do the right thing for us the right way so that we can see the error of our ways and change so that we can follow what you would have us to do. You point out that we need to yield our attitudes and behaviors to the code that you have written in your word. Father, in the meantime, you bless us beyond what we're worthy of. You extend grace to us that we don't deserve. You extend mercy to us when we deserve judgment. You justify us when we were unjustifiable. Lord, you care for us. You watch over us. You heal. You provide. You speak to our hearts. You nourish. You soothe our wounds. Lord, help us to quit being resistant, to quit being stubborn, to quit insisting on our way and fully embrace your way. That's what Jesus called us to do. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.